We're ready. We're ready. Very okay. good. So, good morning, everyone. De Colores. Um, what I've been asked to do is to uh, give, and I have, it's a half an hour, is that correct? That's fine, That's fine Richard. Okay. Um, I'll try to break it in half, but um, so uh, an update on the current status of things in the diocese. Uh, I was asked to give some uh, thoughts on that. And then secondly, uh, a spiritual or theological reflection on uh, the challenges that our country is facing, that we're facing in our, in our culture, in our, in our society. So I thought uh, I'll, I'll do the update and then ask if there are any questions because they're, they're two somewhat diverse things and there may be an area that you would hope I would mention regarding uh, the status of the diocese that I, that I might not touch upon. But I have six areas that I, I'm just gonna report on very briefly. The first one is our, our Catholic Charities, a, a very important uh, outreach arm uh, of, our, uh, of our diocese. Um, you know, we have residential programs. There are three residential programs um, and they really suffered during the, the, the beginning of the lockdown uh, because uh, it was impossible to get people to bring people in or to let people go. So uh, it, 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 it uh, really uh, hampered the uh, ministries uh, that we offer there through those residential uh, programs. Currently, and I, I, everything I'm giving you is very current because we, we just had an administrative board. That's my, my senior leadership group. We meet monthly, at, virtually, as we are now. And, uh, and we just met Tuesday. So the, the information I'm giving you is, is uh, very, very current. So, but those programs, thank goodness, are, are, are now back to a normal uh, working and they're able to admit people uh, into uh, the programs and things are going well. The, the, the difficult uh, counselors are working in Catholic Charities through uh, uh, teletherapy as much as they can. Um, the real problem with Catholic Charities, as well as our parishes and our schools and organizations you might belong to, it, uh, the loss of major fundraisers that would have taken place in the spring. And clearly uh, for Catholic Charities, um, the, the, uh, the uh, soup and salad and sermon, uh, the, in the fall, we've already canceled the uh, come and see. Uh, those are major sources of income and uh, they won't be happening. So uh, clearly across the board, uh, the uh, pandemic has, has caused that uh, loss of income for our diocese, our parishes, and, our, and many of our programs. The second area I thought I would talk about is our schools. Um, we have the sad news of closing three of our schools, two uh, elementary schools uh, and uh, uh, one uh, K through 12 uh, in, in Lebanon. Um, we hope that's the end of, of, of that sad news. Uh, our other schools are, are pretty vibrant. Um, but like, like an individual, as they say, when you, when you get this virus, if there's some comorbidity, uh, it's much, it, it, it can push the individual over the edge. And so it is with an institution. If there is some comorbidity, uh, some financial weakness or institutional weakness, uh, this time of pandemic has kind of pushed some over the edge. Uh, and so we had the, the closing of, of our three schools. We are reopening and we're hoping to reopen in person. Uh, that news has caused an uptick in, in enrollment in a number of our schools uh, because parents are, are uh, eager, I think, and, and many school districts have yet to announce or they have announced either a hybrid, two days in, three days at home or completely at home. Uh, and so uh, I think parents are interested in having their children uh, in school uh, as much as possible. So we, we have a, a, a group <clears throat> that put together the reopening plan. Our superintendent, along with four principals and two uh, epidemiologists uh, worked on that 30 page plan and that's out there in our schools so that we can uh, as much as possible assure the safety of our students and our teachers and staff, uh, but to get our schools back to some uh, uh, form of normalcy. Um, the school should reopen on August the 31st. That's, that's the plan. Some will be using that hybrid method. We have a diverse area, 15 counties. Some are, are uh, uh, going to have to use probably the hybrid option. So that is available where, where it's deemed to be uh, necessary. You know, there were, we were some disappointing decisions from the Supreme Court, but there were two very encouraging uh, 
uh, decisions by SCOTUS uh, in the end of the June uh, uh, session uh, favorable to our schools. Uh, the ministerial exception, uh, which means that our, uh, our teachers are functioning in their capacity, whatever it is that they're doing, as a, a minister of the church. And, and therefore, uh, the lifestyle and life choices that our teachers make are, um, uh, have, have uh, repercussions. They, they have significance. And uh, uh, we, we, we have a, an act, had an active uh, uh, litigation against the Our Lady of Lourdes and the diocese. On, on that very issue. And this the Supreme Court decision what was a help in, in those uh, kind of cases going forward where there is a, a breach of conduct on the part of the teacher regarding Catholic morality. And the second one was the school tax credit program. Uh, you, you're probably familiar with James Blaine who served both in the House and the Senate in the 19th century at the, at the federal level and was virulently anti-Catholic. And while he tried to get a, an amendment to the U.S. Constitution, that failed. But 38 states incorporated Blaine amendments, very prejudicial against our, our church and our schools uh, in the 19th century. Pennsylvania is one of those states. And basically, the Supreme Court struck down that if, if, if the state is going to give aid to private education, they cannot um, uh, be prejudiced. Uh, against a religious or a faith-based uh, school system. Th those were two good things that happened at the end of the Supreme Court term uh, in June. The finances of the diocese, uh, as I mentioned, we're, 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 they are very challenging. Uh, every, we have the Pentecost collection, which goes very much for the education of our seminarians and uh, our retired priests. Uh, that's way down. We have 189,000 uh, $500 so far. Um, usually we're over 200000 and significantly over. And our, our really important collection, the Diocesan Annual Campaign, formerly the Bishop's Lenten Appeal, um, we're $2.8 million under uh, our hope for goal. Now, do remember that this is now a year-long campaign, and so we, we have until the end of the calendar year, really until the end of January of 21, to uh, complete uh, the, the goal, but uh, it, it's very challenging. We do have $887,000 in open pledges. That's a, it's a good thing that people are uh, actively um, uh, making good on. Um, one great help to our parishes and schools and to the Catholic Charities was the uh, Small Business Administration uh, Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, we got uh, something $16.9 million dollars um, to help keep our employees uh, receiving a paycheck during that eight week period. So we're grateful for that. And I think we followed the norms carefully so that it truly will be not a loan, but, but grants and we won't have any uh, obligation for repayment. Uh, a fourth topic is the Catholic witness. As you know, we, we went digital. Uh, the, the price of that uh, printing and mailing is 600 and some thousand dollars annually. And it just got to the point where we really felt that we wanted to go digitally. Uh, we sent out 68,000 copies of uh, the Catholic Witness. Um, we, we did print, you might've received it, or it's on the way anyway. One issue now, the current issue is back in print just to take a survey <coughs> of our lead, uh, readership uh, and um, uh, see what, what the thoughts, the feelings of, uh, of our faithful throughout the diocese are about the digital version. Um, what we can tell, you can tell a lot of things about, uh, we don't know whether you throw the print copy away or use it at the bottom of a birdcage, uh, but we can tell in the digital uh, version how many people open it. And 45% of those who receive the digital witness actually open it. And, and that's a very high, that's a, typically, I asked if that was a good, it's extremely uh, good. We can also tell which articles are clicked on. So it helps informing <clears throat> future content for the witness by finding out what articles are more popular, what, what topics do people seem to be uh, gravitating to. So um, if you receive that survey, I'd certainly appreciate your filling it out. Number five, the vocations and uh, uh, we have three new seminarians entering formation. We did lose some, so our total number entering this academic year is 24 seminarians. Um, the, 
uh, again, we, we, we hope to do that fall program, the Fishers of Men virtually. That's a, a big fundraiser to help with the costs of the formation of our um, uh, seminarians. Uh, we have two big events coming up regarding vocations. Uh, Patrick McCormick is, is with us on, on the uh, 22nd of this month. I'll, I'll be ordaining four transitional deacons one of them belonging to a religious community who serve in our diocese, the Missionaries of the Sacred Hearts, um, and then uh, three transitionals for our diocese. One is a, a, a kind of an exceptional case. Um, he it, has been an Episcopal priest, retired from as a military chaplain, has taken five years in preparation uh, through what's called the pastoral provision, and uh, will be ordained a deacon, and sometime probably, we hope, in the fall, uh, will be ordained for as a priest for the diocese, um, and um, uh, and then on the twelfth uh, of September, uh, we'll be ordaining uh, thirty-five permanent deacons for service to the diocese. That's that has uh, sadly has been postponed. It was supposed to happen, I think, back in June, uh, and uh, then with the, with the uh, pandemic, uh, we'll we'll have to limit, of course, the number of people. Who it's a very joyful time, uh, but we'll certainly have to limit because of the occupancy. It'll be held at Holy Name, our biggest church, and uh, that will be on uh, the 12th of September. The final thing I'll just talk about is the bankruptcy process. Um, everything there is going as planned, with, with one big exception, and that is that the virus has slowed the pace of that legal process. Uh, things that we had hoped would happen in April uh, aren't going to happen until August, um, and we were we were pretty sure, at least those who are guiding us, that we would have been on the other side of this process by the end of this calendar year. Uh, we had our ducks in a row, as it were. We we knew exactly what this process was going to be for us, pretty much. And uh, however, it's just been slowed to a very very a grinding, a, just a, a really slow paced process now. So uh, it's it's no telling how long. Uh, it's going to take us to get out the other end of the bankruptcy process. But just, just to mention that. So um, uh, the one big lesson I think we can take away from the, the pandemic is, is what we're doing right now, how, how helpful um, uh, technology has been to us to keep up. Our, at first, we were canceling everything. But very soon, it became apparent that we, this was so open-ended that we had to begin to hold events, hold programs and meetings uh, virtually uh, on, on platforms such as this one. So um, that, that certainly has been a help to the mission of, of the diocese. Let me stop there and if, if, if any, anybody have any questions um, or, or comments or, or another area that you'd like to hear something about that I, I might have some information on. Hi Bishop, this is Maria Gallagher. Yes, um, Maria. I have a comment and that's just to say that I think this is an unprecedented tsunami of troubles that has, <laughs> that has hit this diocese and that you have to deal with. And I just want to tell you that I pray for you every day. And I'm so very grateful for your leadership and thankful for you because I, I don't, I honestly don't know how you do it, Bishop, with all that's going on. Well, thank you, Maria. And I, I certainly rely on those prayers. And I, I, it's always a big pick me up when I get a note from someone who, who's saying that they remember me daily or regularly in, in their prayers. And I thank you for saying that. But it has been, it's, it, you know, it, we, we started, I, I was not here that long when we had the uh, subpoena for the, uh, the grand jury. And then two years later, August of 18, the report, the devastating report of the grand jury. And then the announcement of the bankruptcy, February of, of, uh, of this year. And, and then March, the pandemic. So it, it, it's certainly been uh, choppy waters, but uh, with the grace of God and the help of the Holy Spirit, we're kind of moving through and navigating uncharted courses, but a course that for some reason the Lord has put us in. But thank you for saying that. Anyone else? Any, uh, any other area that you're curious about that I didn't mention? Bishop, do you see the diocesan center opening up to the public at all soon? Well, at, at, at the present, it's 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 not uh, very limited, uh, and again, it's the it's that issue of uh, 
uh, disinfecting uh, the areas when people, so we, our staff itself is, um, for a while there, we probably only had about 10 of us coming in daily. Uh, and, and now we're opened up to each department has a certain apportion, uh, part of a day or a full day, and then X number of staff that can be in there. And once again, it's all governed by the need to keep the uh, um, cleaning and disinfecting the, the, the various uh, office spaces. So at this point, we haven't talked about completely opening up for, for everyone. Okay, thank you. Bishop, this is Nancy Keener. I'm just wondering how this might affect the women's conference scheduled in October. Well, we have a man on there who knows, sorry, Jim, do you want to unmute yourself? And <laughs> Jim Gontis is of course in charge of that. Hi, Nancy, how are you? So Nancy, hopefully you're on one of my uh, women's conference lists. We are going with a, uh, a virtual conference this year. It is going to be the same date. Um, uh, Emily Stimson, who would have been our keynote speaker anyway, is going to, uh, to be our, our, our keynote speaker. Emily's a well-known, you probably know, well-known Catholic blogger, uh, as well as speaker and um, an author. Actually, she just co-wrote a book on something that is a, uh, a topic that's actually near and dear to my heart, I just happen to have it here, Hope to Die, uh, is the name of the book that she co-wrote with Scott Hahn. And it's on um, the Christian meaning of death and the resurrection of the body. And um, so anyway, but she's going to be talking, her blog is called The Catholic Table. So she's going to be speaking on um, uh, basically the relationship between food and the Eucharist. And, um, and then we will have uh, some other speakers as well. We're changing obviously some things up in terms of the format this year. Um, Bishop Gaynor will also uh, be joining us and, uh, and he'll be uh, providing a talk and there will be some other talks as well. I don't know if any of you were on, uh, Stupa Mill usually has a whole bunch of uh, Franciscan U uh, a whole bunch of um, adult conferences, but they combined them all into one this year. Eva and I joined in. We've been doing a lot of work researching different ways, as well as members of the committee, um, uh, to go about this. And they had a, a three-hour um, conference on uh, called a Night of Hope, and they had they ended up having forty-six thousand people, uh, forty-four thousand, I think. Don't want to exaggerate. Forty-four thousand people joined virtually. We don't have that sort of. We I don't think we have that sort of reach just in terms of being so well known. But it's you know um, we have another meeting this coming week as far as really uh, because our our scope can certainly go much beyond the diocese, although it's still primarily for the women of the diocese. So um, that's what I can tell you right now and. Uh, and the, the online registration form is being, is being worked on and um, including an opportunity for, uh, for sponsors. Uh, one other thing, normally it's about $40. This year, what we're looking at um, uh, is a $10 charge. So it'll be a different sort of conference, but also at a very reduced, reduced rate, but ho hopefully not any reduced quality. But if you want to give forty dollars, we'll take that too. So. That's right. That's right. No amount too small and no amount too big. <laughs> Good. Well, this is Rosanna Marini. You probably know that every every October too, our priests go to Hunt Valley for a, th a theology uh, workshop, uh, an annual uh, opportunity to be together and to con our own lifelong continuing education. That that too has been canceled. Um, I, I'm not sure there, there was the thought of having one day, a few hours, one of our speakers who was very uh, relevant to our current situation. I, I don't know whether that's happened. Uh, Father Wary, do you know, is that happening? No, okay. Yeah, I, we, we talked about it and maybe the speaker wasn't available I'm not, or didn't want to do it in that format. But anyhow, that, that too has been canceled. Um, all right, is, how, how much time it remains, Robbie? 
Uh, Roseanne, you, a quick question and then you yeah, can yeah. Uh, uh, okay. second my first, Yeah, my, this is Roseanne Green. My first quick comment would be uh, how wonderful it is to hear 24 seminarians and 35 deacons to be ordained. Um, it's, it's just wonderful to see that our diocese is flourishing with people with vocations in that way. Um, the second thing was, is that if this is correct, I spoke to my sister-in-law the other day, she lives in the suburbs of Philadelphia, and she said their churches are still not open. So first I want to thank you for opening ours to allow us to, those that can, to go to mass, to receive communion, to have confession and have those things. So, so important and we, I missed it so much during the time. Thank God for virtual masses, but they don't replace community and also being able to receive the all first. And so on that note, just if you have any opinion on, and I just saw in the news today about a, the, the governor of California suing a church out there for wanting to meet and the, the, the idea of religious liberty uh, in the United States with, with our churches and, and where we need to stand with that safety, but yet we do have a right to re meet together. True. Well, I have to say that Governor Wolf um, has always, uh, pretty much from the start, recognized uh, houses of worship as uh, life essential. So we're not in that uh, uh, tight spot that uh, some, like California is. So I, I was always grateful for that. The, the Catholic bishop, we of course met a number of times, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, with the lockdown, um, and and we decided that we would govern ourselves by the the uh, the norms for businesses. So that's why we did close our churches, and we we've had now I think we're up to eight parishes where people who have come to church are now COVID positive, and we got to get that word out to people, you know. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, if, if you were at the nine o'clock mass last Sunday or two Sundays ago, you may want to have yourself tested. Uh, so uh, th those are the kind of things. And we can be sure this will happen when schools open as well. It's just, it's just a natural expectation. But um, uh, people are very, uh, typically we're, we're somewhere between 40 and 50%, I think, attendance. Um, uh, so we've left that uh, the dispensation from the obligation of attending mass in place probably through the calendar year, uh, I suspect, because there are people who are still anxious and 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 I, I don't blame them really if they're at risk, especially um, for not coming uh, to church in person yet. So you're right, the the virtual the, the live streamed mass or the recorded mass is is no uh, replacement. But in these extraordinary circumstances, I'm, I'm glad we at least can um, uh, have our parishioners see a mass coming from there. Of course, we've always been able to watch a mass on EWTN. But I think it's a, a great difference if you've gone to a parish for <clears throat> X number of years to see the inside of your church, to see your pastor and people you might know um, celebrating the Eucharist, even if you can't be there in person. So I'm, I'm glad that our parishes are continuing to live stream. We look forward to the day when everyone can come back together to celebrate. <coughs> okay, Bishop, you can continue, please. Uh, how, what, how much time? Five minutes? You're, you're our speaker now. <laughs> you have uh, 15. 15? Yes. I don't know if it'll take that long. Um, so, so this this is the uh, we we could take fifteen hours really because it, I've been asked to kind of give a theological or spiritual reflection on <clears throat> on what our, our um, what we're facing, what what we see in the news uh, every day beyond the of course the pandemic and that raised at, at the beginning the the theological questions. You know, does does God will uh, this uh, virus? Does God is it a punishment? Uh, for the misconduct of the world. And uh, we could get into that issue of God's positive will or God's permissive will. That, that's, that's an issue about uh, how, do we, how do we justify a, a, a good God, a God of love and mercy um, with the fact that there's evil in, in the world and sin and uh, people uh, hurt one another, and take lives of others. Uh, how how does that uh, work out? So, but I, I'd rather not go in in that direct. What I really would like to talk about, and I think is it's it's even more troubling for us who 
who know the love of God and the mercy of God and, and don't see this as his vengeance on us. But I, I think what really is troubling is the polarization uh, that is more and more evident and more and more manifested uh, in, in uh, the life, uh, the daily life of our, our country. Both the, the, the vehement political polarization uh, the social polarization, the racial, which is so much in the forefront at, at the moment, and also even within our church. Uh, we are a divided church. Um, and unfortunately, while we're meant to be in the world as an icon of the Holy Trinity, the, the unity in, in diversity, uh, we have absorbed the polarities of our political and social uh, context. And, and, and I, I think we, we have this, this div, divise, divisions uh, and, and almost warring factions uh, evident with, within our church. Um, what's, what's underneath that? Well, our, our last three popes, especially St. John Paul II, but certainly also Pope Benedict and St. Francis, say that this really is a crisis in the understanding of the human person. And they wrote and spoke extensively about that. And I think that's what we, that this polarization um, is, is really a, a crisis of how do we understand the human person, the man, the woman, who are we? Um, it, you know, we, we hear this, this word uh, tolerance and it's, it's in the news very regularly, someone either purposely or makes a, mis a slip in their public statement and uh, immediately they're, they're seen as bigoted, intolerant. It, under that umbrella, society is being asked to, we are being asked to abandon two millennia uh, of Christian values and to accept as virtue or at least as neutral what has always been recognized as sin and evil. And that's called tolerance. Now, underneath that, again, is a misunderstanding of the truth of the human person. Um, we, we, have, um, we believe in Christian humanism. It's something that began in the, the 14th century. It's been developed in our Catholic theology, our Catholic morals, understanding um, uh, over, over the, the centuries. And, and basically, it, it's that Every person, every person is made in the image and likeness of, of God, which is the basis of our dignity, uh, the basis of the sacredness of, of human life. Um, but the, her, the person then made in that image must be formed by the truth of revelation that God has told us about him, himself and ourselves and in the teachings of, of, of our church. So there's a formation. This isn't just this given image and likeness, but, but there's an obligation to be formed in the objective truth. And there's where I, I, I see the real crisis in, in our society. Um, it, it, it was given an amazingly shocking expression uh, in, a, in a, um, a decision in, in 1992 by our Supreme Court and it's been echoed in other decisions from our Supreme Court, written by Justice Anthony Kennedy, who retired in 2018. But nevertheless, he was the, the principal author of that decision for our governor at the time, Governor Casey versus Planned Parenthood. And in that decision, Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote this, and listen carefully to this, at the heart of liberty, so what is freedom, human freedom? At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, of the mystery of human life. At the heart of human freedom is my right to define that. Now that place is what I'm gonna call willfulness at the very core of, of, of life. I might have been assigned maleness when I was born, but that objective designation 
doesn't have to bind me if I will to be something else. I'm not bound by any objective norm or standard. You may own that building, but I don't have an obligation to respect your ownership. If I want, I'll burn it down, I'll break into it. You may own the inventory in that store, but I can do what I want because I'm not bound by any norm. I am the determinator of the meaning of existence, the meaning of human life, the meaning of the universe, according to Kennedy. And we've seen that. Now, could people explain that? No, but we've absorbed it. We, 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 we've consumed that Kool-Aid. And, uh, and so for so many in our society, um, this, this whole issue of sexual orientation and gender identity, SOGI, is there, there is no objective standard. It's my willful decision what I want. Um, and and it, it's so contrary to uh, everything that uh, we, we really stand for. You know, it, it, despite all of this talk of tolerance, uh, the Wall Street Journal reported recently that uh, during July, over a dozen Catholic churches were attacked either by arson or vandalism in the, in, uh, in the United States, a dozen of our churches. Now we, we heard all the stuff about the toppling of statues, the Blessed Mother statue. You know, a, a US Congresswoman said that St. Damien of Molokai uh, should be, the statue should be removed from the US Capitol because he represents patriarchy and white supremacist cu culture. Father, Father uh, uh, Damien of Molokai. Um, the, the um, uh, we've heard how judicial nominees uh, to various levels of the the the, uh, the court system in our country have been attacked for practicing the Catholic faith. Yeah, someone someone said dogma is too evident in your life. What do they mean by that? You go by objective standards. Yeah, you know, the dogma is too evident. There there's something that you believe apart from yourself that governs you, and we won't tolerate that. Now, you, you've got to follow the agenda that we make up the truth. Now, we determine by our wills what are the standards to be followed. So the whole thing is, is insidious, and I think it's really at the heart of the crises that we see in our country uh, and, and in our culture. I've got a, 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 a two quotes to bring this to a, a point. The, the one is, is from uh, the founder of the Opus Dei movement, um, uh, Father, now Saint, Jose Maria Escrivá. Uh, Opus Dei is a, one of the major uh, renewal movements uh, for the clergy and the laity uh, in the church. And um, he, he said this, these world crises are crises of saints. Why are these? Because there are too few saints in the world, too few saints in our society, uh, too few saints in our country. And so what he would see this as, and I, I would suggest to us as we're troubled by what we're experiencing and troubled by the reports in the news um, and in the lives of people around us, it, it, is the call to holiness. Now, th these challenges, this upside down world that we're experiencing really challenges us to a greater holiness. If Esquiva is right, then these crises are crises of saints. And, and we see that in Epic's past, you know, when, when, when the world was going to hell in a handbasket, as the saying goes, great saints were, were raised up to, um, uh, to help set things right. No one of them changed the course of history but they were able to make their contributions. And I, I think um, you know, that we, it's not up to the politicians, it's not up to the academics, it's not certainly not up to the media to bring back normalcy in our society. It's up to saints. And, and all of this should, I think, uh, help all of us uh, not to get distracted or, or drown in the crisis, but rather put our focus on, on Christ and on our mission to change the culture, 
in whatever way we can from, from our place, from our perspective, to make our contribution uh, rather than sit in a corner and, and wring our hands. The, the second quote is from one of my favorite folks is G.K. Chesterton. And this isn't exact. I, I actually found the exact quote, but I, uh, I'll paraphrase it. And he said this, the Catholic Church is the only institution that can save its members from becoming a slave of their times. The Catholic Church is the only institution that can save its members from becoming slaves of their times. In other words, the church gives us a transcendent reality, a truth that goes beyond current events. And I think too, when some of our leaders get immersed in current events and have to address every issue and have to have a statement on everything that's going on, we're, we're, we're allowing ourselves to get pulled into uh, that um, polarization because we're taking sides and, and then making enemies. Uh, we're asked to not to ignore it, uh, not to be uninvolved, but to also understand that we, we are guided by transcendent principles and, and, and not to get anchored or weighed down in the polarizing events of the day. The church guides us at, at, a, at, another, at another level, which is transcendent, so that we don't become slaves of our times. So what we're asked to do is to, to live our faith, to live uh, our, our lives awake to the fullness of objective truth, uh, not some norm that I've concocted, but to learn and to observe the truth revealed by Christ about the human person, uh, about our need for salvation, and about the community of faith, which is the church that guides us uh, through history. So we are a sacramental community of grace that transcends all of this chaos. And the more we get involved in the chaos, I think the more we're liable to forget our real identity as members of the body of Christ. Uh, for that, that realizing that this is for us a, a crisis of saints then, and this call to holiness tells me that Corsio is more important than ever before in human history. Um, to take men and women apart, to give them that initial experience and then a community of formation to continue the journey to deepen our love and our service to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so those are comments that I would make about our current situation in the world. And any other comments or, I mean, all right on time. You're doing great, Bishop. <laughs> we can listen to you all day. I, I just looked to see if I was unmuted. I, I'm sure someone would have said something, but I, I heard uh, about distance learning at a university where the, prof <laughs> the professor spent 50 minutes in what he considered to be the best lecture he had ever given. But it was a one-way thing, and he hadn't unmuted himself. <laughs> so no one in the class actually heard. I, I, no one got in touch with him to tell him he was muted. So anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Bishop, for that uh, terrific summary of the state of affairs and uh, I really appreciate your encouraging words uh, for all of us uh, not to despair and and really how to how to keep looking forward and hopefully uh, our leaders will conduct themselves in, in a in a better manner as we pray for them but thank you you're welcome Patrick thank you I just think that quote I've used that in my talk on Thomas More but that talk from Justice Kennedy uh, it is such a clear and shocking expression of that radical subjectivism that has taken hold of, of many people, uh, many people's attitudes and mentalities. But that, thank you for that, Patrick. Bishop, I was listening and uh, I, I was literally on a meeting yesterday where people had their, their disclaimers of what they were identifying themselves as listed right on 
instead of or with their name. And as you were talking, I was uh, thinking how mine needs to say, God made she. <laughs> I'm never adding those to any of my meetings. I don't care what they say. <laughs> Just, nope. Thank you. That was really a, a timely talk. You're welcome, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it down to the basic, what we know. We know God loves us. We know he made us. And uh, thank you for confirming Curcio as a, a way to yeah. bring that truth to other people. And, and, and to conform to objective truth does not limit my freedom. It gives me the proper exercise of my freedom. You know, it, 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 is, it is who I really am, how I have been made, and, and not who I make myself out to be. But there are many people who say, oh, if you have these objective norms, then you're not free. And, and that's, that's a lie. Yeah. Um, a couple quick comments, I, I would say. So yesterday and today, a couple things I heard from completely inane, where NASA is going to rename stars because their names are offensive. And one of them was Eskimo something. So now they're going to refer to it by its scientific name. Can't say that anymore. Then to something truly important on Fox where Donna Brazil and another reporter were, you know, going back and forth about the faith issue because of Trump's comment against, you know, saying Biden was against God, which that he should have never said that. But Donna Brazil vehemently saying how she's a person of faith and she's a faithful Catholic and all of that, but she's a woman and she has a right to choose. Okay, how sad is that? Okay, so you've got those two things. My son lives in New York City. Oftentimes he is like very afraid to even bring up his opinion as a conservative because there are real consequences. You could be shunned, you, you could lose your job, you could, you know, and you're so the call to holiness where you would have enough moral fiber and, and be strengthened in the faith enough to actually say, yeah, I, I'm gonna say that anyway and, and put that out there amongst these people because they need to hear it in a gentle way and all of that, you know, in the proper way, but not to be afraid. So we need that call to holiness to get to that point. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Okay. All righty. 